I'm Connor Rebush, and if you are interested in the finer points of face punching, you've come to the right place. This is Heavy Hands. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Heavy Hands. As always, I am your host, Connor Rebush, and with me is my steadfast co-host, Patrick Wyman. Pat, today we have a fantastically interesting topic, and one that is uh, very newsworthy at the moment. We're going to be talking about Mr. Nick Diaz, as he was called in the very upsetting uh, Mr. Nicholas Diaz, as he was called in one of the most frustrating Nevada State Athletic Commission hearings I have ever had the displeasure to witness. Were, were you able to watch that hearing at all, Pat? I watched large chunks of it, and uh, it was it, it set the blood to boiling. That's yeah. the only way I can put it. Like, Genuinely infuriating. I mean, as as much of a dog and pony show as Nevada State Athletic Commission meetings usually are, and as much screwed up stuff as they've done in the past, you know, everything from congratulating Chael Sonnen for being such a for being such a steadfast friend of the commission. Uh, to letting Alistair Overeem uh, like pin all the blame for a positive steroid test on a doctor on his doctor to winking and nudging at Floyd Mayweather and basically allowing him to schedule his jail time around his fights like this was this was a new low for the Nevada State Athletic Commission and that is that is saying something that is absolutely saying something pretty much the commission is is a is a body so used to to just being corrupt and having their own way that they don't even know how to pretend that they're not doing it anymore. When it's... when the commissioner stood uh, during the Mayweather Birdo pay per view and they asked him about the IV issue, he stood there and he just said, "We don't have any interest in investigating this." Those were his words. He didn't mm-hmm. pretend that it wasn't a viable thing to to look into. He just said, "We're not interested in investigating." Right. This cool. is, I mean, the the Nevada Commission is. In a sport that's full of just dog shit people, like the Nevada Commission is full of, is full of corruption and ridiculousness and just just terrible logic and you know shame, like not to play the high the the high handed moralist here, but shame on them sincerely. <laughs> shame, shame on, on them. No, no, like, I can get behind that absolutely. Like you know Pat Lundvall from the beginning when Pat Lundvall said. Or when they asked, is you know, is Nick, is Mr. Diaz going to testify? And Pat Lundvall says, "Oh well, he better be. He, he better. better be testifying." Like, are you kidding? Like, it's just, I mean, to them chuckling when Diaz's lawyer tries to ob- tried to object, mm-hmm. like that. Just what a clusterfuck of a of a group of human beings. Well, while we spend the next few months uh, just hoping and praying and waiting for them to get sued or waiting for that decision to be appealed in an actual court of law, one who actually respects due process, um, we can we can reminisce about Nick Diaz's career, especially because, unfortunately, if even part of this suspension does go through, and I guess you can't say that he couldn't have expected at least a year or two suspension, but especially if that five-year suspension does go through, it effectively means the end of Nick Diaz's career, um, unless he can get cut by the UFC and go and fight in Asia, overseas. Maybe I would love to see Nick Diaz versus Ben Askren. Love to I, see that. You know, I I don't I think they might be uh, if they can meet his price. I think one FC might be amenable to that. But like you know, one one more thing on the on the front of the Nevada State Athletic Commission before we hop into talking about Diaz. Everybody laughed at Vanderlei Silva when he said that the commission that the commission had overstepped their bounds, and he said he was going to take them to court. Um, you know, like as many terrible things as Vanderlei has done, and as much as he's you know ruined his legacy or whatever, like Vanderlei was right about that. Mm-hmm. Vanderlei was not wrong. And now that we see how this plays out with Nick Diaz, like you know, maybe maybe Vanderlei deserves a little bit of credit for being willing to stand up to the commission. Well, yeah, and unfortunately, it's often these guys who are like the outcasts. Uh, people from difficult circumstances, people who are other to us uh, folks who enjoy MMA. Nick Diaz, Vanderlei Silva, these are not people from our neck of the woods who act the way we act and talk the way we talk and think of things the way we think of them. And so a lot of times they come off as goofballs uh, and we can be like, ah, well, he's a shithead. So, you know, he got punished, but what does it matter? But really, like, these are the first people to go. 
in situations like this. When it's the establishment versus the people, it's the people that the rest of the people don't care about that get taken out first. And so they need to, we need to admire their ability to stand up for themselves. And I, you know, I respect Vanderlei for that. Um, I don't see how he ruined his career. I guess everyone just thinks all fighters are not on steroids. And so mm. it just it just wrecks their right. I'm not, I'm not saying all fighters are, but it never surprises me when I discover that one is. You know what I mean? And so it doesn't yeah. really disappoint me that much either. I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm, I figure a lot of them are. So yeah. I don't know. Like he was in pride. Like did people not think that steroids are going on in the pride era? They were encouraged. They were outright encouraged to use steroids. <laughs> and yet people are shocked to learn that it's still going on now. I don't know. Shocked, what. I say. Yeah, I don't know. So whatever. Props to Vanderlei for that. Props to Nick Diaz. He appears he and his uh, excellent attorney, Lucas Middlebrook, should be appealing this case. Or suing the Nevada State Athletic Commission or whatever is legally tenable option there. But as I said, in the meantime, while we're waiting for that decision to be rendered, for justice to be done, we can look back on Nick Diaz's career. And in my opinion, Pat, Nick Diaz's career is one of the most enjoyable and one of the most interesting and arguably one of the most impressive in the history of mixed martial arts. I think Nick has often been underwritten, perhaps because he is such a strange personality, such a difficult personality to wrap your head around. Um, often a very abrasive person, somebody it's not easy for people outside the game to respect. It's been a little too easy to overlook the accomplishments that he has had in MMA and sort of the influence he's had on the sport as a whole. And, you know, just because his style wasn't always pretty, it was damned effective. And I, I, I'm looking forward to spending the first portion of today's episode basically looking back on his best moments, doing a sort of career retrospective in the unfortunate case that his career may be over. Uh, the best we can do is, the least we can do is celebrate what he did. Absolutely. I mean, I think there are really two ways in which I would say Nick Diaz, Nick Diaz has been influential. Um, and I, I, and I say this, like, I'll, I'm going to make this argument that Nick Diaz, we look back now with four or five years of hindsight, the 2010 to 2011 era Nick Diaz, the guy who was, um, you know, the guy who was beating up uh, Maha Sakurai, KJ Nunes, Evangelista Santos, Paul Daly, BJ Penn. And we can look at that guy and we can say, you know what? He was doing things then that have now become the norm for a wide variety of fighter or for a wide variety of fighters in MMA in terms of the particular quality of his boxing, combination striking, but most importantly the emphasis on pace and offensive output. Like because Nick Diaz was the strike force champion, Nick Diaz was in a whole bunch of five round fights. Nick Diaz was used to thinking in terms of strategy, was used to thinking in terms of giving away a round to win it, to win the rounds later in the fight, um, in terms of putting a pace, in terms of attrition, things that have now become much more common now that every UFC main event is five rounds and we have so many more titles up for grabs. Like those are common things in MMA that everybody needs to think about now. Every elite fighter needs to be thinking about. Diaz was doing those things years beforehand. And you know, now that you mention it i'm trying to think if there were any really effective swarmers before nick diaz like fighters of that very specific high volume pressuring style where the point is not even necessarily to be a technically proficient pressure fighter so much as it is to constantly have your opponent feel pressured um and nick might be one of the first i can really think of who was technically savvy enough and confident enough in his abilities and well-rounded enough to actually put volume on guys at that kind of pace that effectively in Be terms of pure swarmers i mean who else is there in mma there aren't even many now today who are swarmed the way that nick diaz does but there are a lot more pressure fighters and guys who uh use their basically their greater endurance and durability to grind down the opponent yeah, I mean, I would put it this way. Without Nick Diaz, and to a lesser extent, Nate, there's no Conor McGregor in 2015. Like, you know, when, when Conor McGregor debuted in the UFC, people were calling him the Irish Nick Diaz for mm -hmm. good reason. Because, because Conor McGregor, if you had asked him back in 2012 or 2013, I don't know if, you, I don't know if he would answer the same way now, but he, but he said a number of times that Nick Diaz was a huge influence on his style. Now, McGregor is a next-level kind of Nick Diaz from a variety of perspectives. His, his footwork is much better. Um, he's a much harder hitter. His, his, fundamentals are, his fundamentals are probably better. But with that said, the conceptual roots of Conor McGregor's style in MMA would not exist without, without Nick Diaz. Sure. Do you think we should go through some of Nick Diaz's fights or even just him as a fighter and kind of unpack a lot of the 
issues that we've had with his style over the years. Not just the issues, but the things we like about it as well. Absolutely, yeah. You mentioned footwork. I think footwork is a great one to bring up because we all know that Nick Diaz can't cut off a cage to save his life. Um, not at the same time that he's punching. He certainly knows how to sidestep and circle with his opponent, but as Carlos Condit proved and a couple other guys after him and before, uh, people then people started to forget the blueprint, um, Nick can be goaded into attacking in straight lines. His footwork is not built into his punching the way that it might be. How do you think no. he's been so effective despite that? Um, the fact, the simple fact of the matter is that you have to be that. Yes, there is a blueprint for beating Nick Diaz in terms of, in terms of constantly sidestepping, attacking his legs, um, forcing him to attack in straight lines. You have to be really good to make Nick do that. Yeah. Like you have to, like, this is not the kind of game plan that, that, that some scrub can run out there and be like, okay, well, I know how to beat Nick Diaz. Look at the three guys who have made that game plan work against them. It was a Carlos Condit right when we figured out that, oh, yeah, Carlos Condit is actually really good and really technical and really knows what he's doing. Um, George St. Pierre, the greatest welterweight and I would say one of the two greatest fighters of all time. Um, And Anderson Silva, the (laughs) greatest middleweight of all time and one of the all time greatest strikers in the history of the sport. Not just Anderson Silva, but Anderson Silva jacked up on Thai penis pills. Yeah, absolutely. Some, <laughs> some mysterious blue liquid uh, that, that some associate brought back from Thailand that, that we can be fairly sure made uh, made Anderson's genital stand on end. <laughs> so we know that was an especially dangerous iteration of the spider in the cage with Nick that night. Also, also one with a, with a goddamn titanium rod in his leg, right? True. Very true. Like, not just any Anderson Silva, Cyborg jacked up on uh, jacked up on enough <laughs> chemicals to make Bane seem like a uh, uh, to make Bane seem like a, a mere enthusiast. Anderson Silva on what I believe you described when the news first came to light as gas station erection pills. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so long story short, could we give Mr. Diaz a little bit of credit? Um, for those three fights. Carlos Conda, George St. Pierre, Anderson Silva, it must be said, by the way, that um, none of these was an uncompetitive bout. The George St. Pierre bout was the George St. Pierre fight was the least competitive. Um, but Nick had his moments late in that fight, which is which is typically when Nate has his moments in fights. If MMA had more of the sort of pacing of boxing back in the 70s, uh, or even like when not even just 15 round fights, if MMA fights were as long as a 12 round boxing match, if Nick Diaz had 36 minutes with which to work on his opponent, he may have beaten all three of those guys. I mean, I really don't think that the chances would have been slim because I think he was slowly beginning to overwhelm George St. Pierre before the end of the fifth round. He was taking his toll. Carlos Condit. Uh, as the saying goes, Diaz one two five. By the end of that fight, Condit was starting to lose a bit of a step. Even though he had gotten to a rhythm in the middle portion, uh, I, I have no doubt that Diaz would have gone longer than Carlos Condit. Yeah, um, I mean, I think and, that by the to Condit's credit in that fight, he managed to not give in to Diaz's pressure for all five rounds. I think, but I think that you could see the mental toll that that was taking more than yes. the physical toll. Like we've never really seen Carlos Condit tired. But by the fifth round of that fight, I think that Condit was mentally exhausted. That's exactly what I mean. I mean, I think it was already starting to take effect uh, in the second round, probably by the end of the first, where he was like, okay, this is – and it's because Carlos was fighting against type, really, to to fight that fight against Nick Diaz. Because he and his team probably correctly recognized that if they went in there and did the normal Carlos Condit thing of taking a punch to give a punch and and letting your chin be your defense and trying to pick out openings in a guy while he's throwing strikes at you, that Diaz probably would have won that battle um, and would have overwhelmed him. So, But that that's kind of the point here is that it takes a very special fighter to to expose those flaws in Nick Diaz's game. It really does. Not just that there's a bar of skill that must be met in MMA, but it takes a certain level of mental composure, a certain level of quality of instruction, it, and a certain level of experience as well. And it makes sense that three of the most experienced, um, most skilled, and toughest fighters between 170 and 185 were the ones who gave Nick Diaz the most problems, and even they didn't, they didn't blow him out. Yeah, I mean, I think the GSP fight is worth talking about as an example here because there was a specific moment in the fourth round of that fight when you could see it, one of one of two things. Either Diaz had gotten to GSP or GSP finally got old or some combination of the two. I think as, I, like, as I've watched that fight five or six times since then, 
Um, I've kind of gone back and forth, and now I think it's some combination of those two things. Like, I think that, A, all of GSP's years in the sport, like, literally caught up with him in the fourth round there, that you could just see the, and I think in the form of Nick Diaz, who had been his bugaboo for, you know, two years at that point. Like, I think GSP was finally tired and old and, like, and, and Every, every punch that he had taken, it all seemed to kind of catch up to him yeah. in the person of Nick Diaz standing in front of him, still fucking waving him on. Like, that he just kind of he just kind of got old, and, and and all of that caught up with him. I don't know how else to put it, really. Well, th- that's the thing. Like, Nick Diaz is not a fighter who necessarily fights better than you. He makes you question whether you want to keep fighting him, mm-hmm. which is it's very fitting that he is the guy who really brought body shots to the forefront of MMA, because I've always said that about body shots, right? Like, if I get hit in the face, a lot of times it makes me want to swing back. I get hit in the body, I start to ask, do I want to keep swing, swinging back? Like, maybe I'll just take a knee and take a count and take a breather for a minute. And that's, yeah. you know, it's this sort of debilitating style. We were talking before we began the show about Diaz Daily, uh, which both of us agree is one of, if not the greatest MMA fight of all time. Uh, and not just because it's a crazy action fight, which it is, and not just because it has drama and momentum swings, which it does, but also because you can see uh, the gears grinding in Nick Diaz's head. You can see him executing a game plan that he had prepared for Paul Daly. And Diaz often doesn't get credit for the intelligence of his fighting, and it's probably because we know there's that blueprint. We know that he has not been able to adapt to fix certain areas of his game. But... He has taken his limited game and applied it very intelligently throughout most of his career. And that daily fight was absolutely no exception. Yeah, I mean, I think that when you look at that fight, it's clear that Nick Diaz knows his man, right? Like, he knows what he's going to get from Paul Daly when they go out there. He knows that if he tries to put a pace on Paul Daly and if he's willing to stand in there and bang it out with Paul Daly for just a few minutes, that... As, uh, that as time goes on, that's the kind of fight that favors him, that he was going to give away minutes of that fight and he was going to embrace the inherent risk in trading with one of the most powerful punchers at 170 pounds in the history of the sport. You look at some of the guys that Paul Daly's put down, and they're not guys, and that, you know, th- those are real accomplishments. They, like, Paul Daly uh, last year knocked out uh, Alexander Stetsarenko in a kickboxing match. Alexander Stetsarenko then proceeded to go three hard rounds with Nikki Holtzkin and, and come out not really looking dented at all. Mm-hmm. Like Paul Daly is a brutal puncher. And but Diaz, but you think that Diaz looked at the film and didn't know that? No, Diaz knew exactly what he was getting himself into, and he thought, okay, if I can if I can force Daly into exchanges, if I can force him to fight at a pace that he's not comfortable with, Daly then as now, still a guy who pre- much preferred to kind of pick his shots, um, if he could force him to fight at that pace for just a few minutes, Daly was going to be done, and then it was going to be Nick Diaz's fight to win. And you can see that in his shot selection. You can see that in the way that he went about working Daly's body early. Yes, and the moment that stands out to me most in that fight is, I believe after Daly knocks, he knocks Diaz down, I think the second time. He knocks Diaz down, and he's standing over him. He's kind of touching him with kicks, but it's very clear that Daly is hoping to take these few seconds, maybe to wait out most of the rest of the round, maybe to do a little bit of attrition, but mostly he's trying to get some time for him to recover while Diaz is on his back. Because Diaz has, after having been knocked down, he he drops to his back, and he goes to work as guard. And Daly doesn't want any part of that any more than he wants any part of a brawl with Nick Diaz on the feet. So he's like, okay, maybe I can recover, and I can try again next round or whatever. Um and Nick Diaz starts butt scooting towards him. He doesn't wait there with his head to the fence. He rolls over. He kicks at Daly's leg, and he just sits up and starts scooting towards him. And Daly backs up because, of course, he does. He's feeling an immense mental pressure at this point in the fight. And he backs up enough that um, John McCarthy has no choice but to stand Diaz up. And, of course, seconds later, Diaz knocks Daly out. So there's this element of pressure the constant mental pressure in Diaz's game. And we'll talk a little more next segment about how he hasn't always been able to implement that perfectly as a result of his footwork. But to me, Diaz has always struck me as a guy who, who requires less that his uh, st- style be consistently technically perfect and more that it, you just always be feeling the effects of it. He doesn't mind having to do twice as much work to get to the goal as long as you are feeling what he wants you to feel. And that's what I admire most about his game. So uh, let's take one quick break, Pat. When we come back, we'll talk a little more about Nick Diaz. And then later on in the show, we're going to be talking about Bellator, Dynamite, their light heavyweight tournament, maybe some of the kickback, kickboxing matches happening there. And if we have time at the end of the episode, a heavy bag question to wrap things up. 
Okay, wait, stop. Don't skip this break. I know you skip most of them. It's a podcast. It's not a radio show. You don't have to listen to the commercials. But if you follow my very simple instructions, you'll be doing a huge service to Heavy Hands, Pat, and myself. First, go to Stitcher.com or iTunes.com. You can use either of those services to subscribe to the show, which makes it really, really easy to listen to every episode and not have to go hunting for it on our confusing, badly designed website. Once you're there, give us a positive rating and a positive review. That means go to the little five-star thing and click on the star all the way to the right. That's a five-star rating. That's the best one you could possibly give us. And like 20 or 30 words about how you enjoy the show. It may not seem like much, but it's a huge help to us, and we really appreciate it. It helps us bring heavy hands to an ever-increasing audience, which is just good for everybody. So thank you for listening. Please take the time to give us a positive rating and review Uh, next time that you're on at your computer, at your phone, whatever. iTunes.com, Stitcher.com, search for Heavy Hands, give a positive rating and a review. Thank you. And now, back to the show. And we are back. And I wanted to make a few more points about Nick Diaz, Pat, before we move on to the Bellator Dynamite Light Heavyweight Tournament. Um, The thing with Nick Diaz... And, I, and I, I wish I could express this more eloquently. That I can't really come up with a way of saying it perfectly. Uh, but I think this has been one of the real reasons he's been kind of misunderstood as a fighter. And that's and I'm no exception to this. As I've said before on the show, my first ever article for Bloody Elbow was about how overrated Nick Diaz's boxing was. Because everybody talked about... I mean, and it was frustrating for boxing fans <laughs> to go to an MMA forum and, and not be able to hear the word boxing without at least three... Uh, no nothings bringing up Nick Diaz's name because commentators were always saying, oh, the Stockton slap, best boxing in mixed martial arts and all this. It was irritating. But Nick Diaz's style was very effective, and he's not actually a bad boxer. He's actually a pretty underrated defensive boxer, too. That might sound crazy, but um, he's not that bad defensively. Yeah, he's he's hard to – a lot of the time he's very difficult to hit cleanly to the head. Yeah. Like – he, like we tend to remember these times when Diaz ate enormous punches, but that's actually because he doesn't get hit to the head all that much. Yeah, it was like on once the- he once he committed to an attack, he was kind of there to be hit. Mm-hmm. But when he was still stalking you and looking to jump in with that combination where he forced you to cover up, he was pretty good. When he had his jab on you, he'd pull his head, he'd slip punches. Not 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 at all an easily hittable fighter from that perspective. No, um, I mean always there to be hit low kick wise, but that was oh, because. Yes. <laughs> He depended so heavily on keeping you at the end of his jab, and that's partially what made him so difficult to hit to the head. Was like he was never there, there. Yeah, when he was as he was stalking. You know, well, like, and, and, and that brings up the Carlos Condit fight, right? And it's it's always been the Carlos Condit fight, not always, but since it happened, it has more and more become kind of a reason to look down on Nick Diaz, which I find to be a bit disingenuous because so many people were upset with the way Carlos fought that fight the first time around. Mm-hmm. When they watched it, they were all irritated that it wasn't a brawl. But now people have been the, taken the high road, the moral high ground, and said, oh, well, Nick couldn't do this. He couldn't avoid this. Uh, he kept coming forward, and then Condit would just pivot, and he'd get away from him. And that's true. But I don't think that it's actually necessarily an indictment of Nick Diaz's style. Because to me, Nick, Di- Nick is like a momentum fighter. He is a swarmer in the surest sense, where just like in that daily fight, it's less about trapping you and keeping you there and absorbing as little damage as possible and more about making sure you know that you're constantly on the run. You have to avoid Nick Diaz. If you're against the cage, you're trapped. And if you get away, you're about to be trapped. You know what I mean? So when Nick comes in and throws in a combination, hits three punches on Carlos Condit, and and he skirts away out the side, and he's moving around again, Nick is like, He's not frustrated or upset that he has to cut he has to do all that work all over again because what that means for an opponent of Nick Diaz is they have to do even more work than him to get away from him. He doesn't mind chasing you down because he knows he can run a damn triathlon and typically <laughs> when you're running a triathlon you don't have an angry Nick Diaz coming after you. So it makes it a very exhausting process to escape from him over and over and over again. And there are other fighters like this, like Sergey Kovalev is kind of like that in boxing. Um, not particularly effective when he gets you trapped compared to when you're moving backwards and when you're running away from him, when you're trying to escape. That's when he gets his big shots in. That's when he feels most confident. He wants you to be mentally breaking. Yeah, I mean, and and that's really what Diaz's style is all about, right? It's him betting that he can keep moving forward 
for longer than you can stay disciplined on the retreat. And because really, it's not just about pivoting and getting uh, pivoting and getting out of the way. It's a knowing when to sit down and when to pick your spots and when to uh, and when to do your thing while still staying disciplined enough to to, to retreat as necessary. That's yes. a very difficult thing to do, and there are very few guys who are disciplined enough to do that for all uh, for all five rounds. You yeah. know, we saw we saw BJ Penn stay disciplined for a couple of minutes when they fought and have great and have great success when he was disciplined for a couple of minutes. The problem is, you know, he got dragged into he got dragged without really uh, without really realizing it into Nick's pace. Like the first couple, the first minute or so of that fight was minute minute and a half of that fight was BJ's pace, and yeah. BJ was winning. Well, that's the thing is, is, is typically against fighters like Nick, you have to sometimes slug it out with them to get them to back off, mm -hmm. to convince them that you are not to be trifled with. You're not to be walked down and chased around. And but Nick is smart enough to know that that is, a, in fact, a sign that his game plan is working. Once you feel like you have to slug it out, you feel that you're under enough pressure that you have to change what's happening right now. And so he just invites it. It may, all, may not always be the prettiest fighting style. Um it may be a bit re revisionist to call it like some kind of brilliant approach, but it suits his personality and his, his skill set very, very well. And as we said before, it's been remarkably effective against a pretty damn diverse array of fighters. Um, we mentioned the Paul Daly fight. One that I think gets overlooked a lot is that Glayson Tebow fight. Nick Diaz fought Glayson Tebow from the bottom, on the feet, counted his wrestling relatively well, uh, pretty damn effectively. The KJ Noons fights... Two absolute classics, uh, both of which Nick Diaz was on his way to winning the first time he got uh, a bad cut in the first round. Always been a problem for him, but both of them he was on his way to overwhelming KJ Noons, who, like Nick Diaz, arguably the more technical boxer, but in that second fight we saw what happened when Noons got dragged into Diaz's kind of fight. Yeah, and, and it's hard not to – it's it's just really hard not to get dragged into Diaz's kind of fight. And even Anderson Silva had moments where he was very close – to getting dragged into yeah. into Nick Diaz's fight, particularly when because Nick Diaz's game was all about frustrating, right? Like, and Anderson went into that fight with with a pretty with a pretty clear game plan. He was either going to he was either going to be all the way out or all the way in, right? Because it was it was a safe assumption that he, as the bigger, stronger fighter and the and the guy who'd fought as high as two hundred and five pounds, and you know one of the most skilled clinch fighters of all time. That if he got inside, he was going to have the advantage. Sure. Well, it quickly became apparent in that fight that when he tried to get into the clinch with Nick Diaz, he was not, in fact, the better clinch fighter. That's all. That was a tremendously underrated part of Nick Diaz's clinch game, or, or of Nick Diaz's overall game, is how good he was in the clinch, and that was the best that we had ever seen him. Yeah. So he did a great job of keeping Anderson Silva at arm's length whenever Anderson tried to get into, tried to hop into the clinch with him, and so Ander, so like. He like Nick succeeded in landing volume at those times when Anderson was was out there at arm's length trying to reach for him, which is which was a bad habit of Anderson. It was something that Nick and and I know Joe Schilling, who coached him for that fight, had picked up on in watching film. Like so, they were ready to exploit that. Yeah, yeah. I just think we need to get the impression away, get rid of the impression that Nick Diaz is some kind of dumb robot, smart yes. fighter, underappreciated. Always fun to watch. We hope that he's not suspended, that his career isn't quite over. If he wants it to be, um, he's also one of the most business-savvy fighters in the UFC now. So, you know, a guy who, as you said, Pat, has gotten paid uh, and has made sure that he's gotten paid as much as he's worth, unlike a lot of fighters who get taken advantage of by the system. So uh, we respect Nick Diaz. We've always enjoyed watching him fight. We hope everything works out for him. Um, but now, on to fighters who are not sitting out for the conceivable future. Bellator has put together their dynamite tournament, hearkening back to the days of, was it Dream that always oh, uh, teamed up with K1? Pride, uh, uh, God, uh, the, didn't Pride do uh, dynamite or was that, or was that yarn? No, no, it wasn't Pride. God. It was Dream oh, and no. K1, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dream and K1, I think. Dynamite was always a series of tournaments. Um, K1 dynamite, it was always called, but it was kickboxing and MMA, two sports that belong beside one another. Kickboxing, Makes a more natural fit for MMA, I think, than boxing uh, as like a co-promoting kind of thing. Shorter fight times, more of a more of a action style. You know what I mean? You're not going to tune in to see a 12 round uh, boxing clinic, a 12 round kickboxing clinic in K1. And so it's a 
promotion that was always very successful, always a lot of fun to watch. And now Bjorn Rebney and the fine folks at Bellator MMA are doing the same thing. Uh, Bellator 142 coming up on September 19th. They are going to be having you know, some kickboxing and whatnot. We're going to mostly focus on the MMA today because they've got a really compelling light heavyweight tournament. And then, of course, at the top of the card is kind of a sham of a title fight, banking for the last time, probably, off of Tito Ortiz's marketability. They're stacking Ortiz against the new light heavyweight champion, Liam McGeary, who, um, what's a quick prediction, Pat? How's that fight going to go? Uh, I think that McGeary is going to choke Tito unconscious at some point, uh, at, at some point during the fight. That is, that is my prediction for At it. some yeah. point during – it may not even be the end of the fight. He might do it most of the way in the middle just for fun and then do it again to end the bout. Yeah, I mean – now, don't get me wrong. Tito has a path to victory in that fight. McGeary likes to play off his back, and maybe Tito can still get some of the old uh, ground-and-pound magic going. Maybe. Um, you know, it could happen, but I think the most likely scenario is that, you know, Tito is old and, you know, God knows how many skull fractures and neck fractures he's got going into this fight. Um, <laughs> like, something bad is going to happen to Tito. God knows how many skull fractures that man has endured yeah, in the training just, camp. Just so many. Oh, Tito. But, uh, you know, at, but at any rate, like, it would be, like, I would be very surprised if Liam McGeary didn't win that. McGeary, legit talent, one of the one of the closest things we have to a, to a real up-and-coming light heavyweight um, in MMA. Really good fighter. That should be fun. But the tournament, the tournament is interesting. The tournament's great. We've got Phil Davis, until recently a UFC fighter, was recently cut after... Uh, it wasn't cut. They just uh, the uh, he he became a free agent and Bellator made a better offer. Better offer, okay. So the UFC did they try to renew his contract and and Davis got a better. Yeah, the UFC made him an offer and Davis went with uh, and went with Davis went with Bellator's, which was I think for about twenty five or thirty grand more per fight. Well, good for him. Um, we've got a four man light heavyweight tournament and in the first round we got Phil Davis. It's a one night tournament, by the way, which is great. We've got a one-night tournament. We, maybe we can talk about the one-night tournament format a little on today's episode, too, and talk about how it changes fighting, because it's a really different kind of context for MMA. But quarterfinals, we've got Phil Davis and Emmanuel Newton as the first fight, and the other is Mohamed Lawal, King Mo Lawal versus Linton Vassell. And I think we're going to talk mostly today about Emmanuel Newton, who is just one of the weirdest fighters you'll ever see, and one of my absolute favorite fighters to watch. I love watching Emmanuel Newton fight. I don't even always know why, but I always enjoy his fights, every I single think, time. Well, I think it's just because, if we are gonna, if we can hop right into it, I think it's yeah. just because Emmanuel Newton is so odd. He is such an odd fighter to watch. I mean, there's we've talked a lot about rhythm on this show in the last, uh, in the last almost year now, mm-hmm. and Newton has none. It's very, very hard to predict what strike is going to come next. He, he faints a lot. He probes a lot with his left hand, but, but he rarely throws it. Um, it's, just, it's just a weird mixture of, of strikes that's very difficult to time. It's very difficult to predict. Um, and, like, it's very – he just moves in such a strange fashion. He takes more steps than he needs to. Like, it's, it's odd. The whole thing is odd. Absolutely. I think the, the steps are a very key thing here. Emmanuel Newton has a very odd style of footwork where um, what, what a lot of fighters don't do is actually get themselves close enough to the opponent. And despite his often lunging strikes, Emmanuel Newton does a really good job of sneakily moving into range with his opponent. Um, I'm thinking of his fight with um, his most recent fight with Attila Ve, uh, mm-hmm. when a lot of the fight was spent in Ve trying to counterpunch Newton which is a tall order, and I respect Ve for how well he did it, all things considered, because counterpunching Emmanuel Newton is a nightmare. Um, and Newton does a great job of moving forward in tiny movements and disguising these with awkward feints and disguising it with leg kicks. Like, Emmanuel Newton will often use the lead left leg kick two inches way forward. Like, you don't notice how much closer he's gotten to you when the kick lands, but he set his foot down six inches closer to your body, and that brings him close enough to sling an overhand right at your head. It's the it's the standard, you know, old Team Quest combo, right? Sure, it's yeah, basically. The, the, the Dan Henderson or Randy Couture inside low kick to, to overhand right that we see all the time for it that's so effective despite it being – you know, just a basic, just a basic two strike combination for exactly that reason. It disguises your forward movement and often brings your opponent's hand down or brings their eye level down uh, to disguise a strike to uh, to take their eyes off a strike that's gonna that's got kind of a looping arc to it in general. Yeah, and uh, Newton's kind of brought another level to it because it's not just a sort of one off setup like Dan Henderson's often is, but 
he moves his head really well when he kicks. Mm -hmm. And so it makes it not nearly as much of a liability as the the team quest application often was, where he'll throw the kick, and if he feels that you're going to come back at him, that he's not free to just launch his overhand, then he'll just swing his leg back into southpaw and retreat on an opposite angle. Uh, So he kind of attacks you in a V motion. He comes at you and moves away off to his left in southpaw um, with his shoulder in front of his chin, just this bizarre, awkward movement where he's swinging away from you in such a way that it's very difficult to punish him for these kicks, even though we've seen other fighters get punished for them many times. It's also made more effective by the fact that Newton actually throws his left kick to not just the legs. You know? Yes. Like, Newton has, I would say the left kick is probably the best strike that Newton throws. Yeah. He throws a really, really nice body kick. Yes. Um, and, and he mixes it, and, and he, he sets it up nicely, too. Like, it comes... He, he tends to throw it in sequence with that, with that right hand, but he plays them off of each other, and he uses both strikes to get the angle that he wants for the other, right? Like, yeah. So when he, th- when he throws uh, that left kick, he, it's not just that he comes down in front of you. It's that he's also taken a step to the outside, so he's, he takes himself off of, your, off of your, the line of your eyesight to land, uh, to, to land that right hand. It gives him a, it gives him a weird... Uh, kind of blind angle to land the right hand, or conversely, when he throws a right hand, when he throws the right hand first, he's using that to get the to get the angle that he wants to uh, to disguise the left kick as it comes up. Like it's it's very it's very tricky. It's very hard to see the main strike, whatever whichever one of those two it's going to be coming. Yeah, and the stance switch helps add to that too. When when Newton is throwing that kick to your leg puts his foot offline, and then he's traveling off to your left, you start to look for that. So you start to basically follow his body as he moves outside your lead foot. Um, And then as he moves that way, you're following his body, your eyes are on his head, or you're watching his kick, your eyes are maybe drawn down. You're completely unaware of the looping right hand. And he very rarely throws a straight right hand. It's always a looping punch where it travels up and out and around your line of vision. And so it plays perfectly off of that left kick. It's these basically these two circular strikes from either side, but both of which have opposite angles to one another. So if you're worried about one, your eyes cannot be, you have to feel the other one coming. And some have been able to do so, um, but you can very rarely see both at once if you focus your attention on one. And Newton does a great job of making you focus your attention on one because he is actually a relatively threatening striker. He doesn't hit all that hard, but you have to worry about what he's throwing at you because he's pretty accurate when he does commit. Uh, He hits hard enough to worry about, and he's mixing in his grappling and all these things. He's just a constant threat, even though he's not much of a volume fighter. Uh, The other thing I want to talk about with Newton um, is that he likes to counter with his left kick moving backwards, which is something I see almost nobody do. And I'm actually going to ask you, Pat, if you have any suggestions to help me figure out why it's as effective as it is. Um, I think it's because... He throws so many different things. Uh, off, like, like there's very little telegraphing to the way that Emmanuel Newton throws strikes in general. And because the setups, like, like so we just spent a, a solid chunk of time talking about the way that New, uh, the way that Newton blends together his left kick and his right hand. Those are two of the more basic strikes that Newton throws. But he also throws a lot of side kicks. He throws a lot of spinning back kicks. Uh, he throws a lot of spinning back fists. There's a lot of variety to what Newton does, and and there's a lot of craft to it all um and so as far as why it's so hard to see coming it's because the the left kick moving backwards a lot of the time he just brings it he just brings it up and chambers it he doesn't throw it off of a he doesn't he doesn't throw it off of a like a switch step or anything but that's the same motion as his side kick that's the same motion it's, it's the same motion that he uses when he's going to switch stances it's hard to tell exactly what he's going to do at any given time i think that's why it works i think he's also a particularly dynamic kicker uh some of his spinning kicks are a little awkward like maybe he's, he taught them to himself rather than having his technique fine-tuned by someone else. But he throws them pretty athletically, right? Mm-hmm. He, he has a good sense of his balance when he throws. And so the thing that occurs to me is that it's very difficult to kick while moving. Uh, most people find trouble with this. Most people have to like move their feet into position in order to kick, which is why if you have a feeling a guy's going to run away from your spinning back kick, you might switch into southpaw and do a shift step forward and then throw it from the opposite stance. So you can cover all this distance to get him on the end of it before he's able to move back completely out of the way. Um, Newton does a great job of using his pivot as a motion to adjust his planted foot. And so when Newton throws a retreating left kick, he will start with his right foot, the plant leg, 
the, the foot that remains on the ground, although in this case it doesn't, he will start with that facing the opponent, and then to get torque into his kick, he will rotate that foot. But instead of rotating it, he will hop backwards. So he actually creates distance while generating torque for his kick, all of this while, as you said, not throwing the kick with much of a chamber or with a switch step to add power to it. He's very comfortable just lifting his leg. Um, and I don't think the kicks are particularly powerful, but they add up. Uh, and I admire the fact that he's able to do that without getting hit, uh, without getting knocked off balance. He will be, he'll just basically uh, jump back into the cage, throwing up a left kick as the other guy runs at him, and then just kind of waggle and head movement his way out of there. I think that's what makes him, we were talking about this before we, before we came back on air, but I think that's what makes Newton such a uniquely difficult matchup for, for King Mo, about whom you and I have, have kind of diverging opinions at this point. Like, like yeah. I tend to think that, uh, I tend to think that, that the difficulty of, time, of timing him, of predicting what he's going to do, is really tough for a guy like King Mo, um, who I think spends a lot of time trying to outthink his opponents and predict yeah. what they're going to do next because he relies so heavily on leaping in with uh, with single strikes and, and and kind of leaping in with his with his takedowns as well like you can't time or predict Emmanuel Newton so inst- so while while King Mo's trying to figure him out Newton's hitting him or in the case of their first of their first meeting knocking him out with a spinning back fist that Mo just never saw coming yeah you know we talked about Carlos Condit versus Nick Diaz earlier Emmanuel Newton's kind of like what Carlos Condit tried to do in that fight, but it comes really naturally to him. Yeah. He doesn't have to, like, change it and, and do a bunch of in-depth preparation. It's just his natural state to just pick what easy targets are there. Uh, just chipping away at your legs or the unprotected side of your body with quick little strikes. Doesn't bother too much of really hauling off and, and putting a bunch of weight into them. But he's just going to break you down, break you down, and rely on the fact that it's going to be such a weird approach that you can't figure it out. And I said before, like, Newton is so bizarre because he does not really appear to know how he's going to beat a lot of his opponents until he beats them. You know what I mean? Like, if we watch his fight with uh, the fight with Joey Beltron, Beltron was giving him a tough fight. It didn't really look like Newton had done any special preparation to prepare for a pressure fighter uh, with decent boxing, offensively at least, like Beltron. But he figured out how to beat him by, by making Beltron hesitate just enough. His style has such an element of awkwardness to it. The fainting, the weird rhythm, the unorthodox steps, the strange, sometimes powerless strikes that he's he's got an unparalleled ability in this division in particular at light heavyweight to adapt to a wide array of opponents and do very well against them. I think that's partially what's made him so successful in Bellator in general, particularly in their tournament format. Yeah. Like that, you know, it's, there's a difference between a one night tournament and a tournament where you're fighting every month or every six weeks, but still you can't do a full camp. You can't do the, you you can't do the kind of in-depth opponent specific preparation that you would do for a UFC bout where you're announced 10 weeks out. Manuel Newton would probably be great on tough. Yeah, absolutely. He's exactly the kind of fighter who would who would excel under those circumstances. Whereas I think the guy that he's fighting, Phil Davis, is is pretty much the opposite. Um, that's a, it's an intriguing fight. I don't think it's necessarily going to be a great fight. Probably won't be. That, yeah, I, I think it's going to be weird. There's going to be a lot of kind of uh, like pitter patter striking at range, and then Davis event, like diving on takedowns, having to work very hard to get them, and eventually kind of grinding it out. Like I like I think Davis is probably going to take a like an ugly decision, mm-hmm. uh, but but it's going to be it, it'll be interesting to see that kind of clash not just of styles but of personalities. Yeah, it, it makes you it makes you kind of wish that uh, it would be a five round fight because I think Newton would have a much better chance of winning a five round fight than a three rounder. Oh no question, no question because at all. He was uh, suited to the tournament format, and then after that, he was fighting for several fights in a row in five rounders. So it it, it had the same effect. It gave him a lot of time to feel out and ad- adapt to his opponents, and to let his the natural difficulties of his style take their effect. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, well, so Connor, should we take a break and after we come back, uh, maybe talk about uh, maybe talk about our, our picks to win the tournament and uh, take a heavy bag question? Yeah, that sounds good to me. So we'll take a quick break and we'll be right back after this. Okay, so here's another way you can help us out: go to your couch, lift up the cushions, and scrounge around in the creases for uh, change, lint, uh, like bent paper clips like a thumbtack that you stab your thumb on and then you scream alone in your living room throw all the stuff out except the change 
All right, now take that and deposit it into your bank account or your PayPal account. Head over to heavyhandspodcast.com and click on the donate button on the right side of your screen. Whatever money you just found, which you weren't using anyway, send it to us, all right? Because Pat and I will use it. That money helps us keep this show on the air and free of charge, which is great for you. It's great for us because that way we're making a little bit of money. The donations are a huge deal for us. So please go to heavyhandspodcast.com. Any spare change that you might have lying around, hit the donate button on the right side of the screen and send it our way to help us keep this show live. Thanks. And now back to Heavy Hands. And we are back. Pat, before we get into our picks for Bellator Dynamite's tournament, what do you think makes a one-night tournament? We mentioned it a bit, but what do you think it stands out about the one-night tournament format compared to what we are used to seeing in MMA today? Well, I think the big thing is that it just cuts down so much on your ability to prepare, right? Like that, And this is, you know, we don't see a ton of of opponent specific planning in sports where you do a lot of, where you do a lot of one, one day or one night tournaments. So yeah. you don't do a lot of that necessarily in say, you know, freestyle wrestling or Greco Roman wrestling. You don't do a ton of that in kickboxing. Like you may prepare some for your first round opponent, but like, you don't know who you're going to fight after that. Like it's just those, those kinds of things are not huge parts of the structure of the sport. Whereas in sports like boxing, or MMA as it's done as it's done in the UFC that is the sport is planning for specific opponents past a, past a certain point you know past the time when you have 6 7 years as a as a fighter under your belt what your camps are your game plans yeah you know and you're, like, you expect to have a full camp even in boxing it's not as pronounced as it is in MMA a lot of guys in boxing maybe i'm just thinking the UFC but a lot of guys in boxing fight every 4 or 5 weeks or have they get a fight assigned to them? They they get an offer four weeks before the date. Um, yeah. In the UFC, it's typically like we're very used to a two month camp. Yeah, and that and that influences a whole bunch of things, down to how much weight guys cut because guys get so much notice. When you have an eight or a ten week lead time, you can start your diet then, and you can you know you can cut thirty thirty five pounds to get down to to get down to your weight class. That's much harder to do with a shorter lead time, and that's also less of an advantage in a one night tournament where cardio and energy reserves become important, where just sheer durability becomes a more important factor. So, who do you think it affects most in the Bellator Dynamite tournament? I think it affects Phil Davis the most. Yeah, honestly, I think because I think he's the biggest guy in the. T- so I think Linton Vassell may be Linton Vassell may be bigger, but I think it's probably safe to say that Davis is is cutting the most weight. I think he's probably cutting fifteen to twenty pounds. King Mo walks at, it walks at like two fifteen to two twenty. King Mo is not a big light heavyweight by our standards these days. He would be about a slightly above average size UFC middleweight. Yeah. Um, but so I think it affects Davis the most. I think that he coming from that situation where he's had those big lead ups, those big camps. All, pretty much all of his training partners are UFC guys who are used to functioning the same way. His coaches are his coaches are UFC are are known for coaching fighters in the UFC. Um, I think that it affects the least guys like uh, probably Manny Newton, who doesn't seem to do a whole lot of opponent specific game planning, as you mentioned. Not, even when he has the opportunity yeah. to do it, that doesn't seem to be his thing. Yeah, and I, I it almost it's almost a shame to me that Phil Davis, who I think is probably the toughest matchup here for Newton. Um, mm-hmm is the one he's matched with in the first round. Because I think that I like that there's an opportunity for fighters with Newton's bizarrely specific skill set to shine. And I think one night tournaments are probably something that would really, really benefit him as a fighter, his style of fighting. And so I, you know, I wish he got maybe an easier bracket. It's, it's pretty obvious. They're hoping to set up Davis versus Mo Lawal. Mm-hmm. They're, they're biggest names. Um, do you have a suspicion as to who will win? Um, Overall, the entire tournament, my 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 gut my gut um, feeling is that King Mo will probably win the tournament. Yeah, I, I actually thought I was going to have to fight you on this. No, but, no, um, I, you know, I think that the fact that Phil Davis is going to have to fight two fights in one night is really going to play against him here compared to to Mo, who I do think has pretty decent cardio and good recuperative abilities, despite the fact that you know he's not Emmanuel Newton in that regard, but he's more used to it than Newton, I think. Uh, more, more, more fit to it than Davis. I mean, and yeah, um, he also has by far the easiest matchup, right? Yes. Like, like Vassell. Like we haven't. There's a reason we haven't talked about Linton Vassell of all the of the three guys or of, of, 
of the four guys who were in this tournament. Like Vassell is he's big. Uh, he's six foot four. He looks like he cuts quite a bit of weight. Um, he he makes good use of his size. Uh, he's got he's got a nice long jab and left kick, but he's plotting. He doesn't really hit very hard. Um, he relies really heavily on top control grappling and especially uh, snagging the back. And mm-hmm. against a much faster, more powerful wrestler in, in King Mo, there's very little chance he's going to repeatedly get him down and to work his top. And a much more technical wrestler. I mean, Mo Lawal is yeah. a good wrestler. He, he's a very skilled wrestler. Um, yeah, extremely so. Yeah, and in that regard, I agree with you. Like, Vassell, has a, Vassell is not a bad fighter, but he has a very rough matchup with Lawal. And... Um, I can guarantee that no matter what happens in Phil Davis's fight, he's going to be feeling the effects of a fight with Emmanuel Newton. Not that Newton's some kind of crazy banger or anything, but Newton is going to make the fight awkward. He's going to make Davis worry about weird things. I don't think it's out of the question that Newton beats Davis. Oh, absolutely not. But, absolutely not. Yeah, but my immediate suspicion is that Davis banks a few rounds um, just on the virtue of his wrestling. And his submission grappling, which is underrated and very good. Yeah, I mean, the the thing that plays against Newton in that matchup is his willingness to tie up. Yeah. That that Newton does not place a huge emphasis on on getting away and creating space. Like if Newton decides for whatever reason in a given moment that he wants to wrestle you, that's what that's what he's going to do. Like he, Pretty much. he doesn't it, like he's been willing to he was totally willing to wrestle and grapple with Liam McGee. <laughs> How many submission attempts did he get caught in in that fight? She's uh, like f- at least 15. Submission yeah, I was going to say a dozen, and I think I was guessing conservatively. A lot is the answer. Yeah, I, ju- I literally just watched that fight. It's at least 15 submission attempts that he gets caught in. And But like a normal uh, like a normal fighter would think, huh, maybe I shouldn't do that. Emmanuel Newton, that just never crosses his mind. So I think that like while he could win that fight by kickboxing at range with Phil Davis, he's not going to do that. I think he's going to be far too willing to tie up with him on the inside, and it's probably going to lose him too. He may also be surprisingly effective in the wrestling. The thing is, is even if getting caught in those submissions by McGeary, Newton still managed to escape from every single one and beat up McGeary from top position. And while it's unlikely he gets top position on Davis, it's not impossible that he manages to get Davis's back in an awkward kind of transition. And Newton's it's pretty possible, good in yeah. those spaces, and he's got actually a, a very good back take and rear naked choke game. Yeah, it just seems very. It just seems pretty unlikely to me. I think I agree. if you get caught in those interstitial spaces with Phil Davis, he's going to be the one who wins those exchanges. Like if you want to beat Phil Davis, you like like this. This reminds me of the discussion that we just had about Nick Diaz. Like it's become kind of conventional wisdom at this point that that Phil there's a game plan for beating Phil Davis, but we forget that the guys who have done it have all been pretty good. You know, yeah. like and Emmanuel Newton is not is not, you know, the 2012 version of Rashad Evans when it comes to shooting blast doubles and working from the top. Yeah, absolutely. And he beat, I mean, Leona Machida is probably better than Emmanuel Newton as a range kickboxer. He's yeah. a better defensive wrestler. Uh, and, you know, Davis still awkwardly beat him. Yeah, I mean, so. the key, like the key, <laughs> you're like you're i don't think it's actually a hot take but you but you firmly believe that phil davis beat leoto <laughs> my guilty admission my, my guilty admission that davis actually won two rounds against it's, leoto machida it's not it's not crazy at all and hopefully now that we're more than two years out from that people can kind of look back at that fight and admit <laughs> that machida really didn't do a whole lot of anything yeah it was like, like well it was like a machida fight you know you watch it you're like yeah he's doing fine like this happens he's not doing a bunch of output but the output he puts out is really pretty but, you know, like, if you're going to score the fight fairly, Davis did a lot of ugly shit <laughs> and won an ugly decision. That's yeah, pretty much what happened. I mean, that's, that's kind of where I stand on it. But, so, yeah, I mean, I think that that fight probably plays out in Davis's favor. The Mo, uh, Mo uh, Vasso probably plays out in Mo's favor. But, you know, a fight between Davis and Lawal, that's, that's an intriguing fight, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, the, the favorite to win the tournament has to be Francis Carmo, who is who is the going to destroy Roy, Roy Botten in the alternate bout. Is he on this card? Yeah, Francis Carmo is the uh, Francis Carmo. Roy Botten is the tournament alternate bout. It has um Francis Carmo versus Luis Philippe Linz on Sure Dog. Yeah, that is, they they haven't updated it on the Fight Finder. Okay, but Linz, right. Linz pulled out, believe it or not, with dengue fever. That is a first oh, that I've heard in MMA. He ha- Linz has dengue fever. My God, I hope he's okay. Yeah, seriously. He pull, like, it's like pulling out with consumption. That doesn't seem like a thing that should happen in like yeah. a modern sporting context. It's rough, too. Be, Linz is a talented guy. Linz is a guy, he first showed up on my radar like four years ago when he was on the Bloody Elbow scouting report that uh, Leland Rowling and uh, Smoogie did. 
like years and years ago, Linz was on that, and it and he he had it like an, he he kind of got held back, and he had a terrible knee injury last year. Uh, but so this was supposed to be his comeback fight. Wow. But. Dengue fever. Dengue fever. Jesus, what a horrible turn of events. I'm, I'm sorry that I'm laughing. I know dengue fever is not a funny thing to experience, but it is very odd uh, yeah. and very unexpected. Yeah. But so, yeah, I mean, I could see I, I could see LaWall Davis going either way. I, mm-hmm. I, I tend to think that in a battle between two guys who really don't like to get hit very much, the one who hits harder at range probably wins that. Yeah, that's kind of my suspicion as well. I think that Davis, I, I agree with you, I think he's going to suffer the most from the one-night tournament format. I think he's, he's probably not going to be able to to go the full three rounds with Lawal as effectively as Lawal will with him. And, you know, Davis, God bless him, awkward, bizarre striking style that he has this weird incongruence between the two sides of his MMA game. He's been very successful despite that. Um, often he's managed to win ugly kickboxing matches against opponents who probably should be out, be, who should be out striking him. So that's cool. But I, I agree. Lawal is the better striker. I, I mean, I, you expected to argue with me about Mo. I do not like at all the direction that Mo's uh, boxing game has taken in the past few years. I thought he was a much better boxer back when he fought um, Hodger Gracie. Mm-hmm. I thought that was probably one of his better performances. And now he's got this really awkward style where he's just forced to improvise constantly with his defense. He's just got his head close to his opponent, his hands up in this, like he's just parrying everything. And then if he parries it or he's wrong, he's exposed and he has to do awkward ducking and fling himself. All these big explosive movements required. And he's panicking because he's improvising. He doesn't have a system of defense in place like he used to. Um, it takes all this energy and it's ugly to me as a guy who really admires efficient boxing, but he still is a great athlete. He still has good timing and he still hits like a Mack truck. So, you know, it's hard to imagine Phil Davis easily winning that bout. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. But so we like, uh, so we like some, com- we like probably King Mo to win the tournament um, so should we should we move on to uh, to our heavy bag question? I think that we should, and we have a great question. Oh, I don't even have the sound effect ready, and I'm not going to bother to get it ready. Um, <laughs> whatever. So Pat. we went to the trouble of making us that lovely sound effect, and here you are complaining about it, Connor. My I'm not. God. I'm not complaining about it. I love the sound effect. It's just. <laughs> It's don't don't throw me in front of the bus here, Pat. The bus is coming. The bus is coming. <laughs> um, the thing is, is I just don't have it ready, and I'm not going to pause the audio to do it. We keep things real here on Heavy Hands. We like it to be the live experience. So I'm just going to go to the question. I'm sorry, our friend Oxygen Addiction from uh, Reddit r slash MMA. We love your sound effect. We'll use it next time. Um, our question this week comes to us courtesy of Logan Smith. We've answered questions of his before at Loganosaurus Rex on Twitter. And he asks, which up and coming MMA striker should we keep our eyes on as the new hotness? What do you say, Pat? What's your answer to that question? Well, I, I would give uh, I would give a two part answer to that. I think that there are a fair few good ones who are who are coming up. But um, I think if you want to look at the heavier weight classes, I would point to Khalil Roundtree. Uh, who is uh, who is a black house guy? He is uh, he is the protege of Lyoto Machida and Anderson Silva. He's a big, athletic, powerful southpaw counterpuncher, which is a pretty rare skill set. Mm-hmm. Um, it's especially rare in a guy who only has like three professional fights under his belt. Um, but he's got another fight coming up, I think, next month, and he'll probably be ready for the UFC within another within the next year or so. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would look for him. He's he's not exactly a high output guy, but he throws. But when he pulls the trigger, he throws combinations. He throws hard. Um, and he's he excels at placing his shots. Like he's a he's a very promising striker. He has has what I would call a lot of the intangibles um, to make a, to make for a good striker. So that would be my first answer. What's, what what do you have, Connor? Well, I only have one answer because I'm not an overachiever like you, Pat. I just achieve at the level that normal humans can aspire to. My answer is uh, Invictus strawweight Alexa Grasso, and we have mentioned her once before on the show, and I have mentioned before how much I love women's strawweight. I look at the rankings at women's strawweight. I look at the women coming up in this division, and it's just like the Wild West to me. Look at all the action fights that are possible, all of these really fun prospects who have yet to be tested against each other. It just screams like possibility. It's like um, flyweight in boxing is the same way, or like uh, cruiserweight in boxing is the same way. Like All of these really talented boxers don't necessarily get the recognition they deserve. It's the perfect division for MMA hipsters, Pat. It really is. It really is. I wrote a, I, speaking of that, I wrote an article about, uh, 
about that in Paige Van Zandt uh, a couple of weeks ago for oh, Bleacher yeah. Report. It was a great write-up. You guys check it out. Um, it was your first article for Bleacher Report? Or was it second after the uh, preview? It was my second. Second after my preview, after my preview of 191. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, Alexa Grosso is a very, very fun fighter to watch. She reminds me – she doesn't have the counter-wrestling, though she does have a, a, a pretty solid ground game. Uh, but she reminds me of Jose Aldo in her striking in that mm-hmm. she is – Maybe the one thing that reminds me the most is is that she she pushes her cross the same way Jose Aldo does, um, and I, I hate to I hate to criticize Jose Aldo, but he has this bizarre habit of overextending overextending and pushing his right hand when he throws it, but he blends it with such beautiful head movement and he mixes up the trajectory of it so well it makes him really effective, um, and then unlike Aldo, well, he's become better combination puncher recently, but Agrasso is still very early in her career and she's shown a a very admirable commitment to combination punching. She puts her hands together really well and she mixes in nice low kicks and body kicks to change those things up. She keeps her hands in a good offensive and defensive position. She parries well. She uses head movement. I think that she's not there yet. Like if Alexa Grosso was made to fight Ioana and Jacek tomorrow, she would probably get tooled. But she's got the potential to be the fighter who could really, really give a stiff striking battle to Yin Jacek in a couple of years. Yeah, I mean, she works at a fantastic pace. She, too, she's got yeah. really nice, solid defensive fundamentals. She comes from a family of boxers. Like, I think her dad and at least I think she has several brothers who are all boxers. She's been boxing. She has the kind of boxing background that we rarely see in MMA mm-hmm. in terms of somebody who gets into it relatively early in life. Like, we don't see that all that much in MMA. Yeah. Um, but so she has she has legitimate skills. She's got she doesn't have a ton of power in her hands, but no. I would imagine there will be more coming as she gets older. She's only 21 right now. Yeah, so, I think power can be developed. I think like when you when you get the confidence to sit down on your punches and to 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 keep your feet, whereas now it seems like she's kind of rushing through a lot of her combinations. Mm-hmm. Um, I agree with you. I think that she'll probably become a little bit more of a venomous puncher as she continues to develop. Yeah, and and my second answer is going to be uh, World Series of Fighting featherweight Hakeem Dawodu, who is just a monster in the making. I mean, he yeah. was a, he is a, not a credentialed kickboxer, but a good enough kickboxer that he was scheduled for a, a, a lion, uh, for lion fights for the, the Muay Thai promotion uh, for a fight with, uh, with Malapet. And that was not a miss. That was not a mismatch. <laughs> not a mismatch. Was, you fight Malapet and it's not a mismatch. It says, it says a good deal about your kickboxing ability. Yeah. He's, I mean, he's got a great deal of Mo- both Muay Thai and kickboxing uh, experience and he's taken to MMA like a fish to water. He's just an outstanding athlete enormous power in his hands Mm -hmm. um a really nasty clinch game which i think has helped him make the transition to mma fairly easily really strong double collar tie uh really strong side clinches um really does an excellent job of manipulating his opponent's posture and from there it's been pretty easy for him to learn takedown defense and, and and the like he's even shot a few takedowns of his own so he's becoming a complete fighter but he is a nasty combination striker throws hard strikes um vicious clinch and uh hard elbows too really nasty yeah. elbows brutal uh, elbows yeah i think he's he's one to watch he's now four and oh um and i think he's signed with world series of fighting for the foreseeable future but though they will they will probably overmatch him with uh with their champion at some point in the not too distant future <laughs> yeah it's sad to say hopefully he can be brought along more kindly elsewhere or maybe world, world series of fighting will inexplicably smile on him though i don't expect them to yeah, but he's a lot of fun. He's got a lot of potential as well. So we hope that answers your question, Logan. Keep your eye on those guys. Alexa Grosso. Um, oh, my God. I'm going to mess it with Wilma's first name. Khalil Roundtree. Khalil Roundtree. What's Wilma's first name? Uh, and Hakeem Duodu. Duodu. Oh, my God. I'm thinking of a different boxer now. Um, Hakeem Duodu. Check those guys out. They're Pat's answers. They're not mine. I don't have to have them 100% right. Uh, we hope you enjoyed today's show. Pat, what do you got coming out this week that people should keep their eyes on? I have a preview of the uh, Bellator Dynam- uh, of the Dynamite card. With uh, I'll have previews there, both the MMA matches and the kickboxing matches, um, at least for the main card. And then uh, I will also have, pr- coming probably Friday, an article on uh, why, more or less, the uh, light heavyweight and heavyweight divisions are in serious trouble. Cool. Well, so what are you uh, doing this week? As for me, I'm looking at an article on Emmanuel Newton. I have to understand the bizarreness of this man's game, and I have to help you understand it too. I don't know how successful I'll be, but at the very least, I can look at it and marvel at its strangeness, uh, especially because I, I fear that I'll be disappointed in watching him lose to Phil Davis this weekend. Uh, but then before that, I'm going to be breaking down 
the style of a very impressive young prospect in boxing who fought last weekend at Errol Spence Jr., who I think is likely to be the next big thing in the welterweight division. And so I'll be talking about that on Bad Left Hook. I think that's more or less it. So I hope you guys enjoyed today's show. We're looking forward to Bellator Dynamite. We are not looking forward to Nick Diaz not being able to fight, but we can take this opportunity to look back on what has been an incredible career and appreciate the fantastic fights that Mr. Diaz gave us. Maybe if he gets lucky, the UFC will do him a favor and release him and let him go fight overseas. Because I would not at all mind seeing Nick Diaz fighting Ben Askren in one FC. I, I would I would favor that matchup. Would you agree, Pat? That would that would be fun. That would be a great deal of fun. Who do you think would win that fight, Pat? Uh, I think that Ben Askren would probably it would probably take it because you as uh, as mouth, Diaz Pat. himself says, he is a holder, not a hitter. <laughs> That's a very good point. Holders often beat the hitters, but it doesn't mean respect we respect the hitters any less. So thank you, Mr. Nick Diaz, for all the entertainment you've given us over all the years. Hope everything works out for you. Uh, we're looking forward to the Bellator tournament. We hope you enjoyed today's show. And if you came here for the finer points of face punching, you came to the right place. This has been Heavy Hands. 